My name is Dr. Jim Grimes. I have a private practice in uh, North Orange County in Brea. I live about 10 minutes from Disneyland with my wife and my three children. I currently have two daughters in college. One's at Biola, one's in a school called Oak Valley. Um, and then my son is six years old and is being homeschooled by my wife. Um, I graduated from Rosemead School of Psychology back in 2002, uh, which is a fair while ago. Um, I used to work for Disney, for those of you who were here in the other session. That means I shot hippos for a living, <laughs> plastic hippos. Um, I love soccer, I love scuba diving, and I love spending time with my family. I also deeply love helping people through uh, difficulties that they go through. Uh, the specialty that I work with is complex trauma. Um, so I deal with people who have been through horrific and tragic experiences. Um, but this afternoon, <clears throat> we have the fun subject <laughs> of talking about depression. Um, and as I talk about depression here today, I'm going to hopefully start off with something a little fun and let Eeyore talk a little bit <laughs> about the difficulties he goes through. And then from that, I'm going to get a little clinical. Well, no, I'm not going to get a little. I'm going to get very clinical on you. I'm literally going to go through the DSM diagnosis for depression. Uh, I want you to see what it is. I want you to understand what it is we look for. And then after I've done that, I want to talk about how depression forms, kind of how it's created. I think that'll be a little more fun. That'll be a little more enjoyable. And then I'll talk about the types of treatment that are out there for depression. And then what I'm going to do is I kind of wrap this up is I'm hopefully going to give you a number of resources. Um, I didn't see any of the handouts that I sent in for it. Um, but you'll see some on here. And if you want them, I'll need to get a piece of paper going where you can give me your email addresses. And I'll glad you send the forms I'm talking about. Okay. Um, but I'll give you some real practical skills and tools that you can use uh, to help address, deal with either depression that you may be having or depression that you may know others around you are having. If you do have questions while we are going through this process, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and just ask away. I find it's easier that way than trying to wait to the end and go back to something that we've already moved beyond. So depression. Um, I'm not going anywhere. Oh, there we go. These are some just basic statistics regarding depression. Um, during 2013 to 2016, 8% uh, of Americans age 20 and over had depression in a given two week period. Um, women were almost twice as likely as men to have had depression in that time frame. And over a 10-year period from 2007 to 2015, the percentage of adults with depression did not significantly change. It was the same across the board. And this is a National Institute of Mental Health study. So this is a broad, very vast study that researched and examined uh, a broad selection of the population. Uh, the prevalence of depression decreased as the level of family income increased. That one surprised me. I wasn't expecting that. Um, about 80% of adults with depression reported at least some difficulty with work, home, social activities, uh, or social activities because of their depression. Now, here's Eeyore. Let's let him tell us a little bit about depression. Sorry to disappoint you. Guess I'm too dull to be around. Can't blame you for moving away. I may have just the thing. Up, up, up you go. <laughs> there you are. It's an awful nice tale, Kanka. Much nicer than the rest of me. Not much of a house. Just right for not much of a donkey. Don't want to ruin everyone's good time. Older. You're getting 
Looks like fun. Wish I could have some. End of the road. Nothing to do. And no hope of things getting better. Sounds like Saturday night at my house. Did I get your tail back on properly, Eeyore? No matter. Most likely lose it again anyway. So that's Eeyore. That's a really good description of what depression is <clears throat> and how people think and how people feel when they're stuck in that place. Um, so if we begin to look at depression and what it is and what it is as a clinical psychologist that I look for, it starts here. Five or more of the following symptoms have been present during the same two-week period and represent a change from previous functioning at least... One of the symptoms is either depressed mood or loss of interest in pleasure. It means depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day, is indicated by either subjective report, example, they feel sad, empty, or hopeless, or observations made by others. In children and adolescents, this can also be exhibited as an irritable mood. Um, with men, they also get angry. Men don't always go to the quiet, depressed, withdrawn place. They can get angry. Uh-oh. My clicker's not working. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, a markedly diminished interest or pleasure in all or almost all activities most of the day, nearly every day as indicated by subjective or by observation. This is what is known as anhedonia. If you ever hear that word, that's exactly what it's talking about. Anhedonia is the inability to feel and or experience pleasure. So this means food doesn't taste as good. Shows you like to watch are no longer funny, no longer interesting, no longer enjoyable. Um, and it goes on. A person can experience significant weight loss. Um, when they're not dieting or weight gain. Um, and this is usually represented by a change in 5% or more of their body weight. Um, they can also have a decrease in appetite. With children, as it says, you just look for them not to meet their usual or normal markers. Insomnia or hypersomnia, people are either going to sleep more or they're going to sleep less. And usually it's significant. When I say sleep less, they may get to three hours a night, if that. And that could be over a course of a couple days. And then for the hypersomnia where they're sleeping too much, they might be up for four, maybe five hours a day. And usually they sleep like that because they just don't want to face their day. Psychomotor agitation or retardation, meaning they can't sit still. They're restless. They're uncomfortable. They can't focus. Or um, the retardation where they're just lethargic and they just sit there. Um, the term I use with my clients is literally a, a bump on a log. There's fatigue or loss of energy, like I mentioned, every day. They just have no motivation. There's no desire to get up, to do anything, to go anywhere, to participate in anything. Everything has lost its meaning. Another way to think of it is the world has lost color. It's gone to, to graze is what it's, it's done. We're still not done looking at the clinical experience yet. Uh, there's deep feelings of worthlessness um, or excessive or inappropriate guilt. And this is usually off the charts. Um, a, a good way of describing this is self-loathing, um, which is a form of self-hatred where someone can literally not stand to see themselves or be with themselves. There's a diminished ability to think or concentrate. Uh, when people are depressed, they just can't get as much done as they used to. They can't stay focused as long. They can't remember as much. Um, if they're in school, grades will start to drop. 
if they're at work, performance will begin to decline. If something usually takes a half hour to do, it can take a depressed person two to three hours to do it uh, because they'd rather be doing anything but whatever that is. And they also have reoccurring thoughts of death, um, not just fear of dying, but actual dying. Um, this can suicidal. This could mean um, I'd be fine if I got ran over by an 18-wheeler. Um, if I didn't wake up in the morning, I'd be okay with that. We're still not done yet. The symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. They, they can get into trouble at work. They'll get in trouble at school. Um, parents will get really frustrated. Um, I should make an in, a distinction here with adolescents. Um, their typical tendency to sleep in until 2 or 3 in the afternoon, that doesn't mean they're depressed. It just means they're not going to bed till 2 or 3 in the morning because they're too busy playing on Instagram and talking to all their friends and everything. Um, the episode is not attributable to the psychological effects of a substance or other medical condition. This means they can't be using a drug and coming off of it. When they're coming off of a substance, often you'll see depressed-like symptoms. And then there can be other medical conditions that people will suffer from that can mimic depression. Um, if you have um, a hypothyroidism, uh, it produces very much depressed-like symptoms because the thyroid isn't active enough. So their energy level is low, their ability to focus is low, and they often get misdiagnosed with major depression. Um, note criterion A through C represent a major depressive episode if you have it. Um, response to a significant loss, this would be like bereavement, financial ruin, loss from a natural disaster, or serious medical illness, may include the feelings like we've described with depression and everything. In other words, if they've had something like this, you can't diagnose them with depression. It has to be in excess of this. It's got to be complicated grief. We're still going. The occurrence of the major depressive episode is not better explained by this is, I would prefer for people to be majorly depressed than get these diagnoses because they're far worse uh, in the sense of schizoaffective, schizophrenia, schizophreniform, because these are all. Um, delusional disorders, and this means they're really sick. And there has never been a manic episode. If they have a manic episode where they get really happy and excited and they talk really fast, think Tigger uh, from Winnie the Pooh. Tigger is kind of manic, where he's bouncy, 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 fun, 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 fun. If they've got that, then they are diagnosed with bipolar um, because they're cycling between being up and being down. And then note, this exclusion does not apply if all of the manic-like or hypomanic episodes are substance-induced or are attributable to the psychological, psychological effects of another medical condition. In other words, you can still give them the major depression diagnosis if it's substance-induced or due to like a, a hypothyroidism. Whew, that's finally, that's everything I have to sit through and talk through and work through when I'm trying to decide if someone's majorly depressed. Um, an interesting thing about depression is most people just think if you're diagnosed with depression, there's one type. That's not true. In mental health, there's actually three different forms of depression. You have mild, moderate, and severe. And that can be diagnosed as a single episode or recurring episodes. Recurring means it just happens. They've had it happen multiple times. And there has to be a, a, a good month to two month break between the episodes for it to be considered a reoccurring episode. Okay, But mild, they're not going to be curled up in a fetal position on bed, unable to get out and go into the world and do anything. They're going to look fairly normal. They're going to go to work. They're just not going to engage much. They're not going to talk much. Um, and they're not going to enjoy eating food. They might not even enjoy watching movies. Moderate, you're going to get someone who's going to have some struggle going to work. Maybe they get in four out of five days. Um, they may not eat as much, or they may eat too much. In your severe, this is where you finally get what most people expect to see. In your severe depression, this is where people are crippled and in bed. They can't get up. They can't go to work. They can't function at all. So... 
let's talk about a little bit about how depression forms. Okay, this is what we would call our apparently normal part of self. This is the way we normally interact with each other. This is what we want people to see. This is what we want people to experience. This is what we want people to know. Okay, and then an event will occur. And this event will cause such as a broken relationship. This broken relationship will cause an emotional reaction. Okay, maybe even a loss of a pet and the emotions that are associated with it. Now, what do you normally do when you have something like this? What is, what is something that you might normally undertake if you've got a broken relationship or you've lost a pet? What might you do? Cry, Cry? yeah. Might talk to a friend. Might even pray about it, might even journal about it. Well, as we do that, an interesting thing starts to happen. The intensity of the emotional experiences start to get smaller. And the more we talk about it, smaller and smaller the emotions become. The intensity of, intensity of the experience begins to drop. Does that make sense so far? Till eventually, it's gone. It's incorporated into our normal sense of self. We don't feel like we're still suffering from and or experiencing that sense of loss. Okay? Does that make sense? Depression, on the other hand, doesn't quite work that way. You have a bigger impact on yourself, some big relationship failure or some kind of trauma, such as a broken relationship. And then these emotional reactions form to it. It doesn't matter how you talk about it. It doesn't matter how much you write about it because it doesn't go away. They still feel like they are there. They still feel like they just broke up with me yesterday or they still feel like I lost my job yesterday or they still feel like the accident happened just yesterday. And what ends up happening is we begin to form defensive mechanisms like a broken relationship. We begin to, you know, if we're over here and we're thinking, I've got pain, I've got loneliness, I've got heartache, I've got loss, I've got all that, and I don't want to feel this. I don't want to feel it, so I develop mechanisms to try and cope with it. No one will ever love me. I have to be in control. I cannot trust anyone. So we stop sharing. We stop communicating. We stop letting people into those places because we hurt so much. Unfortunately, when we do that, the problems get bigger and more things start to be added to that area. Does that make sense so far? And the problem is, is this continues to happen, those events continue to deepen and they grow stronger and stronger. And unfortunately, over time, it becomes even more massive in the sense of the stuff that's stuck. Does this make sense kind of how it forms in the way people get trapped inside their thoughts and their feelings? They can't talk it out enough. So they get more and more depressed like Eeyore. Eeyore just keeps saying the same thing over and over and over again. And he doesn't get anywhere with it. Do you guys have any questions about this so far? Okay, so the question you're asking is how come some people can walk through it so easily just by talking to others and other people have a really hard time? A lot of that depends on the number of experiences they've had over there that have gone on. The biggest factor, how big was the event? The bigger the event, the more likely people are going to become stuck. That's a, that's a simple answer. Because there's, you can look in family of origin and how they handled uh, a lot of emotions growing up, and the way the family dealt with sadness or dealt with pain, and that'll give you a good insight as to why people have or have not moved through things. Is it possible to change the color of the purple? I cannot. Oh, the blue? I cannot. I wish I could. I'm so sorry about that. You can't either? Nobody can read it.
Oh, that stinks. <laughs> All right, technical difficulties. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so basically up there, it just, it just has a bunch of emotions that are listed in the circles um, that are associated that they might feel with a broken relationship. There's loss, there's pain, there's hurt, there's grief, um, and it just goes on and on. And then the defensive mechanisms I described are the same ones I described earlier. They just grow stronger and they just grow deeper. I now know I need to use different colors for this slide. <laughs> Um, and that just keeps going on and on and on. Um, the, the defenses build up stronger, they build up deeper, they, and they just sink more and more into being like Eeyore. Okay. So these are common types of treatment for depression, psychotherapy. Um, Lucy only charges five cents. <laughs> um, there's uh, family or couple therapy. There's hospitalization when needed. There's self-help strategies, and then there's medication, okay? Um, there are a bunch of different psychotherapies out there in the sense of what you can or what will work with, with treating depression. So I'm going to try and tell you what some of them are real quick. The first one is interpersonal, and this is just a very relationship-based approach to therapy, um, and it is a relatively short-term approach that believes relationship issues are the root of the depression and the goals are to aid individuals in improving just their communication and conflict skills. The, the sense is if they can communicate better and they can resolve conflict better, whatever is causing the depression will go away. There's cognitive behavioral, which uh, really focuses on, peop on helping people to identify and replace faulty or distorted cognitions. They're going to look a lot at their schemas and what fosters and holds and maintains the depression for them. Um, they might even work on changing behavioral patterns and that create and reinforce the depression. Um, and then there's psychodynamic. I work much more from this bent, given I went to Rosemead, uh, which focuses on helping the individual to explore the unconscious and unhealed wounds from their past. And the goal is to help the individual learn how their depression is related to past experiences and unresolved conflict. That idea there, that last idea I said, is often what keeps things blocked behind defenses, is, is there are a lot of unresolved emotional hurts and wounds from the past. And then there's supportive counseling, and this just focuses on listening to the person. Have you ever heard of who Carl Rogers is? It's just about empathy. It's just about unconditional positive regard, uh, telling the person they're wonderful, they're amazing, they're fantastic, and the belief is that they're getting the support and the care and the attunement that they were previously missing um, that kind of led to and caused the depression. And then there's one that's called behavioral activation. And this, this one, the goal is really just to get people moving. Get them up, get them moving, get them out of their house. Um, one of the things with depression is when people tend to isolate the four walls they're surrounded by and their thoughts are the worst combination in the world because they just end up sinking deeper and deeper. And then the last one is just problem solving, where it's really about a structured approach to figuring out what's wrong and what they can do to change it. What they do with family or couples therapy, it can focus on one of two things. One can be um, an additional resource to strengthen and encourage the family. Uh, if there is a depressed individual present in the home, this can have a profound effect on the others who are there who are helping to provide support and care because it can be exhausting and draining. Um, you can take a room full of depressed people and put one happy person in it, and that happy person's going to be depressed within five minutes. <laughs> you can take one, a, a room of 100 happy people and put one depressed person in it, and in 30 minutes that room's happiness will have diminished by 50% just because of one depressed person. Uh, that's a good question. Research hasn't delineated as to what the cause is with that, um, why sadness uh, spreads so much more effectively than happiness would. For whatever reason, it just does. That's all I know so far. Um, if I had to guess, or speculate on that, I would suspect because 
Happiness is something that we don't have to have for survival. We don't need it in order to keep going. But if there's something that's a potential danger or a potential threat, then we need to be aware of it. And sadness tends to be one of those things that begins to convey some kind of concern or worry in the area. So that would be my suspicion. I'd be intrigued to see on research on that if they do it. Um, treatment can be psychoeducational, where they're just going to talk about and help people understand what depression is, how it can be treated, and what can be done to help people move forward. Treatment can focus on the interpersonal relationships and how everybody is affected by the depression. Uh, this can be really helpful uh, because oftentimes the depressed person feels enormously guilty and even ashamed for how their struggle and their issue is affecting others around them. Um, and that just reinforces, again, the depression more uh, because they're doing nothing but making other people's life worse. Hospitalization. This is usually only done when they are uh, diagnosed with severe uh, depressive symptoms, and that's because they're a danger to themselves or they're a danger to others. Um, and while they're there, they'll receive uh, a number of opportunities. They'll get individual, group, and or family therapy. Um, I, I know I say medication may be prescribed. I'm wrong. Medication will be prescribed. And the only way they will not give them medication is if they absolutely refuse. Um, typically, when individuals go in for hospitalization, they often start with Haldol. And it's a medication that just really levels people out pretty quickly and will do so for about 30 days before it starts to wear off in the system. Um, and then once the patient is stabilized and is no longer requiring hospitalization, the, what they'll do is they'll often refer them to what's called a day treatment program. And the day treatment program will do a lot of what they experience in hospitalization. They just go home in the evening. And that can be a whole day or that can even be part of a day. Now we talk about medications. I will be happy to kind of answer them for you as best as I'm able. I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, the first one is the TCAs or the tricyclics. These were some of the first. Um, they, are, um, they are well known for their side effects. They are not good, not fun. People really do not like to take them. Um, they can be affected for, effective for people who are non-responsive to more common current medications. Uh, the second after that are the MOALIs, uh, the monamine oxidase inhibitors. Um, these, again, have side effects. Uh, there are certain foods that you cannot eat, such as dairy. It's a real bad combination if you start eating dairy when you're taking monoamine. They can cause hypertension, and in some cases it has been known to be fatal. Um, they have to monitor your blood levels when you're taking this in order to ensure that you're in uh, uh, the right levels and are safe. Then we get into the modern medications. Uh, the first is the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Prozac. You guys ever heard of Prozac? This is Prozac. Um, and what they do is they simply are designed to sit in the synapse in the brain and block the synapse's ability to pull serotonin back into the synapse. The thought and the hypothesis behind it is there's not enough serotonin in between the synapses to allow the brain to fire correctly. So a person ends up depressed because they don't have enough serotonin. So by blocking the reuptake into the cells, it keeps enough there and it elevates mood. All these do is they treat the symptoms of depression. They don't cure the cause of it. Does that make sense? So they can help to stabilize, they can help to level people out, but it's not going to deal with the underlying issue that's present for them. And they have a lot fewer side effects. The typical side effects, uh, side effects um, are headaches, nausea, and dizziness for the first couple of weeks while you're going on. Uh, and they usually take about two to four weeks to become effective. And then there's, sera then there's serotonin norepinephrine, your SNRIs. Um, they have the same effect as the SSRIs, except they're going to do it to norepinephrine as well, too. And then the last one is just the, the norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitors. This would be Wellbutrin, if you're wondering. Um, that just keeps norepinephrine and dopamine in, in the nerve cells. All right, there are a lot of self-help self strategies out there. Self-help strategies 
include support groups. Um, and these settings allow individuals to talk with other people who can relate well to their issues. These are really meaningful for the depressed people. Depressed people often feel like they, um, people don't get them and they don't understand. And when they go to a support group and talk to someone who's been depressed, they feel a lot of relief. Oh, great, someone gets it. They know what I go through. They know how hard it is to get up in the morning, and I don't have to explain it. Um, you can find these through NAMI. I was very excited to see NAMI out there. Um, they do a great job of training and providing groups um, for both those who are depressed, but they do an even better job of supporting those who are a part of their family. Um, and they're one of the few places that actually do that, that support the families that have mentally ill individuals in their family. You can look into celebrate recovery groups at local churches and everything. They do a good job and often will have a depressive group that will meet uh, when, they, when they do their support groups. And then there's things such as Anxiety and Depression Association of America. And there's things like Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Is this easier to see? It was just the blue boxes and everything earlier? Okay, that's good to know. And uh, this last one is a government site. Um, for other self-help strategies, there are online resources. And, and these are growing faster than I can ever keep up with uh, because it happens so quickly. There's apps, surprise, surprise, for your phone or your tablet. Some of these can be the apps called Headspace, Mood Path, which is a depression and anxiety, Youper, um, Reflectly, and Depression Aid Light. Those are all just specifically depression-focused apps. Um, they're all free. Obviously, they do have a pay-for-service portion, um, but they do a good job of providing resources on how to deal with de depression. They give education, and they have some online exercises that you can do to kind of walk through, um, help that someone can use to walk through depression. Um, there's also a great website called the 21-Day Brain Detox. Um, it's done by Caroline Leaf. She's the daughter of Archibald Hart, I don't know if anybody's heard of him. He's associated with Fuller and has done a ton of research there. Um, he did. And she's gone on to kind of carry his mantle once he retired. Um, it's a great site. This is a pay-for site. It's not free. Um, I think it's, last time I checked, it was $35. And you gained access to the site for a year. And you can go through the 21-day brain detox as many times as you would like within that year, year time frame. There's also a lot of books that are out there. I can't list all that are out there, but some that I find that are beneficial and good. Uh, the Upward Spiral by Alex Korb. Um, Negative Self-Talk and How to Change It by Shad Helmster. Uh, a Thousand Gifts by Ann Voskamp. Anybody heard of that book? Okay. It's a great book. It's a, it's a, good, it's a book purely about being thankful. Um, and it challenges you in huge ways. Um, you're, she asks you to be thankful every day for three things. Here's the kicker. She says you can't repeat anything for 365 days. <laughs> she wrote this book out of her, her own personal experience where she gave herself this challenge to do. Um, she does have an online website, and there are a lot of resources on that site on um, things you can think of to be thankful for. The Anxiety, Worry, and Depression Workbook is really good by Jennifer. And then uh, Getting Past Your Past by Francine Shapiro. All great books. Now I'd like to talk about simple strategies. These are things that you can do or things that you can encourage others that you know are dealing with depression to do um, to kind of deal with it. Um, routines. Routines are hugely helpful for people who are depressed. Um, they don't want to step into things. They don't want to do things. So creating a simple schedule to follow can be enormously help helpful for them to get back to. And when I say a simple schedule, I mean a simple schedule. And you're not going to expect them to get up and, and do 20 things in a day. If they can get up and they shower and they go for a 20-minute walk, that's a successful day for somebody that's in a moderate to a severe state of depression. 
Um, set small realistic goals, such as taking a shower or doing the dishes every day. Just do simple things. Um, and I tell, when I talk to clients who are depressed, say, I want these to be ridiculous. Um, I, want it, I want it to be so simple that it would feel like a mistake not to do it. Exercise. This is one of, I push for this constantly. I, I, I feel like I beat a dead horse with all my clients when it comes to depression. One of the most effective ways to start shifting depression is to get out and exercise. Get the person moving. And it can be as simple as a 20-minute walk every day. 20-minute walk. Get them up, get them moving, get their heart rate going. It's going to give them an endorphin release. That endorphin release is going to pick up their mood. And that is huge. If they can start to experience success in that, they're going to start to feel better. Eat healthy. Um, how do you think most depressed people eat? They eat bad. You're right. They don't go for the healthy choices. They go for comfort food. So they're going to go for pastas, cookies, cakes, um, because it's, it's going to make them feel good when they're eating it. They're going to feel bad afterwards, <laughs> but they're going to they're gonna feel good for a moment. So making healthy choices. Uh, if they can eat some protein, they can eat some veggies, um, that's going to make a big difference. They're going to feed their brain what it needs. Um, Daniel Amen, um, he runs a, a clinic. Well, he's got a number now. Um, last time I checked on his website, he had a, a page that talked about depression and talked about different foods that you could eat that would actually help to alleviate depression. In other words, it would feed the body the basic building blocks it needed to make epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. And it, amen is spelled A-M-E-N. Um, get enough sleep. In other words, that can be one of the simple goals. Only sleep seven to nine hours a day. Any less than that, it's not healthy. Any more than that, it's not healthy either. You'll actually become more tired if you sleep for more than nine hours. Other self-help strategies, take on some responsibilities. Um, being active and engaged helps to mitigate the depression. This can even be doing some simple volunteering. You know, if there's something that can be done at the church, bulletins need to be stuffed, good for them to go do. Um, do something new. It's amazing how well the brain responds to actually learning a new task. Don't go too complex, though. The more complex it is, the harder it is for someone with depressed to do, who's depressed to do it. Um, try brushing your teeth with your off hand. If you're right-handed, use your left. Try eating with your off hand. Um, just be willing to embrace the embarrassment of doing it if you try eating in public with your left hand. Savor something. And what I mean by this is like if you're going to eat something... Um, Really stop and enjoy it. If it's an orange, notice the color. Notice the dimples that are on it. Notice the weight of it. Notice the, the wonderful citrus aroma that comes forth when you break the skin of the orange. Notice the difference between the orange on the outside and how pure white the meat of the rind is when you break it. And then notice how wet and juicy the orange is if it's ripe. Um, the way the, the juice just leaks out everywhere. And then just notice the, the flavor and the taste of the orange in your mouth, where you notice the tastes. Not that it's just sweet, but where on your tongue you taste it. Um, that's, that's kind of savoring. A good way to think of this is to think of whatever your favorite restaurant is that you love to go to, you don't get to go very often, where you just can't wait to get there and order your favorite meal. Because when that meal comes... You don't just dive right in and suck it up like we do most our meals. You take your time and you enjoy it. This is that concept. Try to have fun. Whatever that may be, get friends over to interact with or bring friends over for the individual to interact with. And then the, the big thing that I'm going to try and talk about here for the next few minutes is start to challenge negative thoughts. They get stuck in their head and they begin to believe things that are faulty and aren't true. Those things that are stuck behind that block wall or those defense mechanisms. Now, the, the things I'm going to talk about, there's going to be four listed here. Um, gratitude journal, a kindness journal, 
developing an awareness of emotions, preferably focusing on positive ones when depressed, or even lamenting, okay? And I'm going to show you some slides that will give you what would be a peek into what some of these worksheets would be. Um, I didn't find them. Um, yes? I just have a quick question. Sorry, because it's not Sure. Um, I'm trying to think how to articulate it, but can't depression go through things? Like, I think everything, like, despairing, like, thoughts, like, that are... Uh-huh. And it makes you say that it's, it's the obvious, you know... Correct. Like, Yeah, those kinds of things. Um, what I'll often tell you is more often than not, people aren't paying enough attention in those situations. If you look at someone enough, you'll see depressive tendencies. They may be at a social function, but they're going to hang out on the outside of the group. They're not going to be engaged. They're not going to be interacting. They're not going to be having fun. If there's something there that everybody's enjoying, like if someone brings out Rice Krispie treats and everybody's converging on dessert, they're not going to converge on dessert. Or if they do converge on dessert, they're not going to take just one brick of the Rice Krispie treat. They're going to want the whole tray. And you'll see them eating more and more of it than they should. Um, they'll often leave early. They won't stay late. Um, those can be some common signs that are, are seen in that. Um, they're not going to be crying in front of you in those situations. Um, the, the language they use uh, will be more negative in its presentation. Um, they won't be excited about anything in the future. So if you said, hey, what are you looking forward to in the next week? They'll be like, eh, nothing. And so it's not, they're not really, you know, it's just going to be work. That's all it is. It's just work. It's not even fun anyways. It's going to sound more like that um, because not most people walk around going, hey, I'm suicidal. I don't want to live anymore. And a lot of people won't talk about stuff like that because the truth is when someone says that, most people go, oh, that's great. Um, oh, look, I got a phone call. And they'll want to excuse themselves from the interaction because a lot of people just don't know what to do when something like that happens in those type of situations. The best thing you can say, and you don't have to fix anything, as scary as what I'm going to encourage to do will be, simply say, tell me more. What is it so overwhelming? And just, just sit with the person. If you're comfortable enough and you know the person well enough and it would be appropriate, don't be afraid to put your arm on their back. Sometimes just sitting with Eeyore can make a huge difference. It can actually help buoy someone's spirit and help them feel like they're not alone. Does that kind of answer it? Okay. Um, any other questions before I start to dive into this? Yeah, they won't. Yeah, they won't. They won't be there if you're scheduled to meet, or they'll they'll show up repeatedly late um, for whatever the event may be. They may look unkept. Um, their clothes might look dirty. Their hair may not look brushed. They may not brush their teeth. Personal hygiene really starts to decline significantly in depression, especially in the severe state. So. You go to the house. If they're a friend or they're a family member, you go there. And you say, come on, let's go for a walk. Oh, I don't want to. I know you don't. Come on, let's go. <laughs> um, other things you can do if you got a dog. Hey, we gotta go, we got to go walk Scott. we got to go walk Pepper. we got to go take Spot. And you, you go take the dog for a walk. And they're more likely to get up and actually move for that dog than they are for anything else. Um, they actually will respond to something like that because, you say, hey, Spot needs to go for a walk. Um, oftentimes, and I'll do this periodically with clients that are depressed enough, especially if they're living on their own, I'll talk to them about the value of an emotional support animal. Um, and I, I don't have them, there's two ways I do this. One, I have them go out and buy an already trained dog if they can afford it, um, because that just gets them up and it gets them moving. Um, if they're, and I'll do that if they're too depressed. Like they're not moving, they're not doing anything, I'll get one that's already trained. If they've got some movement and some activity, I'll have them get a puppy and train it themselves. And I'll direct them to some books 
because they've got to be moving. They can't stay on their bed. They can't stay on their couch. They have to be active. And the idea of caring for something that they value and they love actually begins to motivate a depressed person because there's something that's dependent on them. Um, so this idea of a gratitude journal, kindness journal, the ideas of emotions, um, even lamenting, this is, well, the lamenting part doesn't, but the other three largely come from positive psychology and the belief that um, people get so rooted in depression that they don't think in this way anymore. So the objective is to get them thinking in that way. So what you can do is you can create, and there are worksheets for this um, that I've created that work with it, but I'm going to describe the emotion one, and these are the directions on it, where you develop an awareness of all the emotions you've experienced during the day, particularly trying to focus on the positive ones. Um, and um, each day note three different emotions that you felt during the day. I tell... I, and I have a feeling wheel, I have a word smiley face list, um, I have a feeling list, um, both with positive and negative emotions are on it um, that I intended for everybody to leave with, but I'm not certain where they are. Um, and then once you've identified that, um, I encourage people to pick a color of crayon that best represents that emotion. There's really intriguing research on this. Um, for instance, the color yellow for happiness. The other one that is typical that most people understand, green is for? No, envy. Everybody's green with envy. Um, and then at the end of the week, what I encourage the individual to do is to pick one of these responses that they've noted throughout the week and then draw it on the back of the page. Why I have, And then to share the experience if they can with someone. The reason, and this is what that regular worksheet would look like. Um, with the emotion part, they're just identifying the emotions that they have, and then they're going to pick a color, a crayon, and they're going to color that wherever it may be located on the body. Okay. The reason I'm having people do this is I want them to start to connect the head to the body. Um, because when people get depressed, a lot of times they're not making these connections. And I want them to begin to understand what I'm feeling, how I'm feeling, and what that's like. Um, with a couple of the other exercises with the thankfulness and gratitude journal, um, even with this one, with step two, I want people to identify the thoughts that are associated with those feelings and where it's located. Meaning if I felt happy when I pet the dog, what was I thinking at that time? Oh, I like taking care of the dog. It felt nice to have the dog there. I want them to identify the thoughts and then I want them to identify the sensations. Oh. It felt good inside my heart to do that. I want them to make these connections because it's going to deepen that experience of that positive feeling, which they don't have enough of yet. Does that make sense? And you can do that with the gratitude. And gratitude is just being thankful. That's where Ann Vos Voskamp's book comes in. Um, the idea of being kind. And when it comes to being kind, it's kindness to self. Meaning, how have I been kind to me? How have I been kind to others? Or how have others been kind to me? Or what ways have I seen someone be kind to someone else? And I just want people to start looking for these things. They don't look for any of these things in life. They don't expect it to exist. So by getting them to look for it, they're going to start to realize the world is not as dark or as bleak or as hopeless as Eeyore presents it to be. Does that make sense? It's an exercise. It's a muscle. Our brain can be trained to think more this way. We just have to exercise it. And each one of those help to do that. The lamenting process can as well too. And I really like this because it fits so much with faith. It's an important process and power. Uh, lament is it's a transcending form of discourse moving beyond the current struggles that you're, you're experiencing. And then it acknowledges the limitations of our struggled struggles that we have in our life currently. And it affirms the value of actually living our life fully and completely. And it grants permission. This is what I really like about the lament. It grants permission to grieve and to protest whatever it is that's happened. And it empowers 
when someone feels vulnerable. David was so good at this in the Psalms. He did it constantly. It prepares the way for new understanding of God. It strengthens our self-understanding as responsible agents, um, which is huge with depression because when people are depressed, they feel like it's something that's done to them that they have no control over and they, they can never change. So lamenting actually helps to begin to reverse that process for people. And it purifies anger and the desire for vengeance. Because oftentimes when there is anger and depression, it's misplaced, either at others or even at the self. And it promises solidarities with those who suffer. It revitalizes praise and hope. It gives room for grief and mourning. And grief is, an, is a normal emotional, spiritual, physical, and relational reaction to the experiences of loss and change. Mourning, in contrast, is the intentional process of letting go of relationships, dreams, and visions as your congregation or yourself lives into a new identity after the experience of the loss. Drafting a lament is a life-giving and life-affirming task for all people and every community. Has anyone in here ever written a lament before? No? Okay. Um, Henry Nouwen has this to say. Um, he calls us to re-remember in the wake of loss when we lose a dear friend, someone we have loved deeply, we are left with a grief that can paralyze us emotionally for a long time. People we love become part of us. Our thinking, feeling, and acting are co-determined by them. When they die, a part of us has to die too. That is what grief is about. It is the slow and painful departure of someone who has become an intimate part of us. But as we let go of them, they become part of our members. And as we, as we re-remember remember them, they become our guides on our spiritual journey. The expression of lament is, is vital for the child of God and is crucial to the work of mourning and revitalization. Drafting a lament is life-giving. So this is what the lament process looks like. Um, and this is part of one of the worksheets, which I will do my best to try and get to you. It starts off with an address to God. The address to God is usually a brief cry for help but can occasionally expand to include a statement of praise or a re recollection of God's intervention in the past. And Psalm 71 is a beautiful lament. And it describes here, verses 1 through 3, describe what this first part is about. Then it goes to the complaint. God is informed about diverse problems or concerns that individuals or a community experience, including acknowledging acknowledgement of one sin, the complaint contains a range and depth of emotional, spiritual, and relational reactions to change. It's the freedom to, to actually say what you need to say. That oftentimes depressed people don't feel like they have a voice to speak. Then it goes to a confession of trust. The psalmist remains confident in God despite the circumstances and begins to see his or her problems differently. So as you're writing it out, the depressed person's going to begin reframing the experiences that they've been through. And then there's a petition filled with confidence in God. The psalmist appeals to God for deliverance and intervention, not bargaining, rather giving legitimate expressions and reasons why God should intervene. This awakens new spiritual energies to overcome the loss and suffering. And then section five, there are words of assurance. The psalmist expresses certainty that the petition will be heard by God, communicating God's trustworthiness and desire for restoration and wholeness, even if it's still yet to come. Does that make sense? And like I said, if on some level we can get a piece of paper or something where people can put down their names and email addresses, I will gladly send each and every one who fills it out um, a copy of the forms that... Um, I didn't have here today.
So I can get you the feeling list. I can get you the gratitude, the kindness, and the emotional journals, as well as the lament process. Is it possible to do this at home with your relatives? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. You don't have, you don't. It's a psychologist's psychologist job. Psychologist yeah. Job? Well, you can, and you can always break this up. You don't have to do it all at once. You can take just the first part, and you can go, let's just do one. Let's just address God. Let's just talk to God, or you can come in here and just do two. What's your complaint? Like, if you wanted to tell God what you're really frustrated, upset about, what would that be? And you can just start to write that down. And then maybe you come back on another day, and you start to go, huh, what if we just trusted in God? So you can break it up. It's not like you have to do it all at once for it to be effective. The point is to get them talking and to get them thinking about things a little differently. And this is something that you can repeat. And the more you repeat it, the stronger the effect becomes. Is there any quick questions here? Since we got like a minute or two. Um, is there anything that you could add when we're talking about postpartum depression? Uh, postpartum in the sense of its treatment or its response? Uh, how about someone that's going through it? Post yeah. Postpartum is a different type of depression uh, where... Uh, a big part of it is the, the shift in the hormones that are going on because of the birth of the child and the adjustment to that. Um, so part of it is helping them to understand it's not them, that it's an actual kind of just a biological difference that's going on, and that with time their body will adapt again and it will recover from it. Um, medications are hard at that point, especially if breastfeeding is taking place. Um, so they can't necessarily step into it, but they can do a lot of dietary things um, in the sense of eating good, healthy foods that will promote uh, the best they can for their brain's health in those situations. Okay? Oh, did you? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, they can get stuck in it, but that's when you just encourage them, hey, let's, let's try and do the other part. And, even, and they're going to say no. And you say, that's okay. You can say no. But we just want to generate one thought. Just one thought. We're going to write down all the complaints. But we just need to generate one thought about how God is trustworthy. About how God can be praised. Um, even if it's just them kind of coming up with some scripture verse that they want to have for it. Um, you just want one. Any other questions real quick? In some ways, in some ways, um, there, there, there's what they call a reactive depression, which is due to uh, a situation or circumstance occurring, and they usually need to process whatever that instance is and how it's affected them. Um, longer lasting, more deeper depressions often are a result of earlier trauma that's occurred in life that is still continuing to affect them today. Social anxiety, that's a different beast than depression. Um, they, they still have a long history. A lot depends on what feeds it. Um, if, it's, if it's due to um, being teased um, or being made fun of in school, you'd go back and deal with the trauma of being teased and what that means for them. Um, if it's based upon other irrational fears, you would have to go in and address those irrational fears. And, um, the irrational fears could be something as simple as I'll contract a disease, uh, the world will end, I'm not safe, um, where they can have more obsessive thoughts about um, bad things happening if they leave their home. And then you have, to, you have to go in and address those, almost have to do some exposure therapy in some way to help diminish or decrease that. That is, yeah, you can't just drag them out because their fear is going to spike and go through the roof. And that's just going to reinforce their need to stay home. And the only way that would work would be if you got them out and they couldn't go home. But that's not a pleasant experience in any way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's why the medications work. 
because it, it does shift the neurochemistry in the brain. Um, but it's one of the chicken and egg things. Is it the neurochemistry that causes the depression or is it the depression that causes the neurochemistry? And I'll look at people and go, yes. <laughs> because it, is, it, really, it really can be both. Um, the neurochemistry in our brain shifts when we get depressed. Um, the whole opening plenary session where he talked about the ability to frown and smile is absolutely true. Um, if, and I'll, I'll tell, when you see someone depressed, they're always hunched over. I, I tell people, I just want you to pull your shoulders back. I want you to pull your shoulders back and I want you to pick your head up. And that alone can make a big difference. I, I'm being told I gotta wrap up, but I'll go one more. Yeah, yeah. It just takes repetition. All of it works on changing the brain chemistry and moving it more towards health. Thank you, you guys. Thank you. Uh -huh.